So the big thing, of course, you both being investors, I think the question that comes to my mind instantly is when you're looking at the space of MLOps and the companies that are coming up in the MLOps space and the revenue that they've been generating in the, the market that is there that has developed compared to the foundational model space and all the hype and the revenue that these companies have been generating. It seems like when we look at those self-serve or ML as a service type companies, they're generating a ton of revenue and it is very much what an investor would love to see. I guess that's why there is a lot of hype and a lot of eyeballs and attention going towards that space. And I'm wondering, because I spoke with Saqib about a week ago, who is an investor at um, Bessemer, and he was saying he still is very confident in the MLOps space taking off and the market growing to being very large, but he doesn't see it being this like straight up or vertical type growth from the companies. It's more of that slow burn. I'm wondering, do you feel the same way? Do you have strong opinions about that? And if so, what? Yeah, I'm happy to start and then let me, you can chime in. Um, I think, uh, so I think broadly, yes, uh, agree with that point. I think the, um, there's two things, I guess. There's like the slope of the revenue and then there's the quality of the revenue and the quality of the business model. And maybe I'll hit on both. Um, the slope of the revenue, the reality of what we've seen in the MLOps space is because MLOps is uniquely powerful in large enterprise use cases where, again, there are teams of machine learning engineers who are sophisticated and there are very clear use cases and lots of data in these enterprises, it, the, the revenue ramp tends to be slower and the go-to-market processes tend to be a little bit less efficient in the early days because it ends up looking a little bit more like one or two million dollar contracts with like large enterprises with a little bit of like consulting style sales because you're kind of trying to fit the sale into what the use case is, but it's a big contract. So you want to do it. And like, it makes a ton of sense. And I think there's a lot of market pull for those types of contracts, but it does make it such that having like true go-to-market velocity, like what you're seeing on the sort of ML as a service foundation model side, it's just a lot harder. It's just a different sell. That said, I would agree with the investor from from Bessemer in that like it, it, there's still a big market there to capture. It's just a very different go-to-market model. Like it's a lot more enterprise sales. It's gonna be a lot slower, but the contracts are gonna be a lot bigger. And ultimately I think it will be very tied to ROI and extraordinarily hard to rip out. And so that gets to this like revenue quality, business model quality piece where I do think the MLOps side, as long as you're being incredibly thoughtful about not doing a true consulting project and offering in sort of a scalable productized way, right. you end up with, like you are selling a product and the mo margins are gonna look really good. And at a certain point, like the payback periods are gonna look really good because the contracts are much higher and it's very hard to rip out and it's very differentiated. It's different on the ML as a service or foundation model side where I think we also have a lot of excitement because the revenue trajectories are a lot higher because you're hitting on like pretty clear market pull, I would say, and market demand. And it's oftentimes you're selling into like consumers or SMBs or prosumers. And so the go to market motion just enables a lot faster revenue growth, which is extremely exciting. I think the hard part there is on the sort of like quality of the business model, you really want to sort of sharply look at what the differentiation is because unless, and we can talk about this more, but unless you're building your own model or have some tech mode or have some UI mode, like a lot of these companies that are all doing the same thing are all going one to 30, you know? And like that's, that is exciting and a little scary. Um, and so I'll pause there, Mami, I don't know if you want to chime in with with more. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I will totally agree with Jill and I think like he, they sort of go-to-market motions and, and sort of like end markets are very different for those two categories. I think zooming out to like, it, it's almost like the, uh, the saying of teaching someone to fish versus giving them a fish where, you know, the, the large language model companies that have kind of taken off have found a, a really 
kind of clean use case or, or in the process of finding a clean use case with a clear end market and often like consumer style demand um, where individuals will get on the platform and subscribe. And what's different yeah, true. when you do that versus MLOps tooling, infrastructure tooling, developer tooling, is that is even if you pick the best company in the MLOps landscape, in the long run, sort of an index of ML workloads, right? It's a like a take rate on ML compute and how much ML adoption it is. So it's it's teaching the the enterprises to fish uh, or the the end customer to fish. And so I think that ends up being the distinction where, you know, if you are you're sort of building the tooling, it can be a longer journey, but ultimately there's this much bigger pool of upside potentially of you know, all the potential ML workloads and all the potential ML developers and all the potential ML use cases versus ultimately building a really good end application that can take off with sort of a consumer style scaling to Jill's point. So I, I love this idea around the foundational models are almost more like how I envision it as like it's B to C almost style where you go, you grab it and it's lightweight. You're up and running within 10 minutes potentially of just putting your email into a website. But then later, that quality of that revenue is not so clear because we are still very much in the early phase and we don't know a what is the moat that is there that these foundational models have, considering everyone has access to these models, unless you're training your own. And so the models are almost commoditized in that way. And then when you compare that to the ML ops side of things and these dev tools, it's a much slower sell and it's a much more cumbersome process. But once you're in, you're in. And it's going to be a real pain to rip that out because of all of the headaches that you went through to just get it working, get the team on board, get everyone up to speed on how to do things. And so I, I can see now, see that. The big question that I've got in my head is how much of what we currently call ML ops, do you feel like could be verticalized into these foundational model type scenarios? So how much of ML ops is now going to not be necessary because you have foundational models that are so much faster and you just, boom, you're up and running in a day and you don't have to worry about any of that white glove treatment, talking with the vendor, having to ask for special features and all of everything that we know that comes with the enterprise sales motion. So how much is going to be verticalized by a foundational model? It's a re I mean, it's a really interesting question. I can, I can maybe kick off and then yeah. would love to hear. Sorry, you're thinking about it, Jill. But um, yeah, I think there's this, I, I think one thing I would call out is like the, the companies that have popped up in leveraging large language models or foundation models so far. And there's obviously we're, I, we're in the, you know, the, the top of the first inning. So there's, there's a lot that that's going to come, but, um, they've mostly been around, um, to your point, kind of like consumer style and application, but not really tied to proprietary data, or proprietary environments, right? It's, it's things that folks can adopt, like they would adopt notion and start typing their notes into or, or start typing text into. And so I think that's like a scale and or like a vector that we think about a lot too for what kind of remains um, within the boundary of ML ops and building your own ML is um, the extent to which you're working with proprietary data, the extent to which you're comfortable sending things out to an application or to an API, um, or even in some cases, you know, if you think about financial services or or healthcare, where your proprietary data is about, where it's a it's a competitive advantage to keep that in house and to train your own models on that. And so totally agree, like there are a number of end use cases and verticals where large models, foundation models are going to build, you know, really exciting businesses. And what that end state is, we can talk about whether, you know, it consolidates to a certain number of companies or where the infrastructure goes. But in, in my opinion, I think there's always going to be this domain of sort of building models in-house using proprietary data for, you know, use cases that already exist or are in this domain that aren't really generative or foundation model based, um, which you could call sort of analytical ML. You could even call operational ML for, for a lot of the kind of live in deployment and application use cases. 
Yeah, I think that's well said. I mean, the only thing I'd add, I guess, is like, and I almost mentioned this at the beginning. I think um, foundational models <clears throat> have just, I think, have opened up sort of a new type of use case or feature or whatever you want to call it for ML ops, which is this like fine tuning. Piece. And so as an example, I think like we spent a ton of time with Alex Ratner at Storkel. He's like an amazing guy. I don't know if you've spent time with him. They've built out a really interesting platform where they're doing data labeling. They've been doing data labeling. They have Snorkel flow, which sort of expands across the entire value chain. And then with the advent of foundation models, they released a new feature fairly recently um, which is this sort of ability to like really go into the snorkel flow platform and fine tune the foundation models such that they are effective for your use case. And so I think even in a state where I, I wouldn't, if I were an MLOps company, I wouldn't be overly concerned about foundation models, to be honest, but I do think it's very smart to take advantage of the hype associated with those models and assume that for many of your customers, like they will probably try to use GPT-3 at some point and it will be relevant for them at some point. And if there's a part of your products that can allow them to more effectively use the foundation models and tune them so that they're more appropriately designed for whatever use case you're building for, that's a great way to take advantage of the hype without sort of like completely pivoting your business model. Oh, I love that. 